people of the Most High. My name is Clarence. I'm pastor of United Body of Christ Church, uh, giving honor to the Most, the Most, the Most High God, my Father and my, my heart, my love, uh, God Almighty, the creator of everything seen and unseen. He that gives us patience and peace, um, giving honor until his beloved son, the only begotten of the Father, the, loved, the Lord Jesus Christ, the author and the finisher of the faith that we have, the one that have made it possible to have eternal life with the Father and the Son by allowing the drops of his blood to be shed, by allowing himself to be pierced. Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah, Yeshua, and then give an honor unto the Holy Spirit, the organizer, the Holy Spirit, um, the, the one that seals us until the day of redemption, the lead, the guide, the comforter. And also give an honor to my father's children, my brother in Christ and through Christ Jesus. I welcome you and welcome you back uh, to another Bible study. Again, my name is Clarence. I'm pastor of United body of Christ Church. Folks, believe it or not, this is my second recording. Uh, my wife and I, we had, um, I went through the recording before. I think that it turned out to be about an hour and 18 minutes long. And uh, my wife, as she was, excuse me, as she was ready to edit, excuse me, folks, as she was ready to edit uh, the Bible study, she noticed that the sound had cut off. And I was <laughs> You know, I couldn't leave, couldn't leave it there. The Lord has some things that he, he needed me to cover, and I just didn't want to have to just be like, oh, well, let's do it tomorrow. So then we're right back with the recording again. We're coming at you with another, another Bible study. This is the conclusion of Jonah. Uh, this will conclude the book here. This will be the fourth chapter. So if you don't have Bibles, don't worry about it. We've got you covered. You, As Bible study, you know, it. My, my company, you know, where I work at, you, you come with the uniform that they give you, uh, pencils, papers, that's all part of your uniform um, to do the job. So when you come into Bible study, uh, you want to make sure that you have Bibles. That's part of the uniform or part of the tools that you use uh, uh, for the particular lesson. So, again, if you don't have uh, a Bible handy or present with you. My wife and I, we've got you covered. You can go to our website at www.ubcchurch.org. Uh, once you get to our website, look towards the top of the page underneath the banner. You'll see tabs running across. Uh, one of the tabs that you'll be looking for is the online Bible tab. We need you to click on that tab. It'll bring up another page. Uh, in the center of the page, you'll see a drop down arrow. Uh, uh, so when you click on that little arrow, it's going to bring up a menu. That menu is populated with the different books. Uh, King James translation of the books of the Bible, all 66 books there. Uh, for today's lesson, you'll be looking for Jonah. So you want to uh, want to bring up the menu, scroll down till you get to Jonah. Right beneath that, you want to select chapter number four. That way you'll be able to follow us verse uh, per verse. Uh, again, we're dealing in a day of deception. Uh, we're dealing in a day of debate, confusion. Um, the, the, the enemy is trying to distract, uh, detour. Uh, you know, we, we want to make sure that this word is dear to us. This word, we want to make sure that the word is dear and that uh, this, this truth is what remains. Uh, heaven and earth will pass away, but it's God's words that's going uh, uh, to remain, if you will. Uh, this is dear. You can't let nobody come in between the truth that you and God shares. Everything needs to line up with what's written here. Uh, and those that you allow to feed you the word of God, it don't matter how they introduce them with whatever credentials. They could be part of an urban league. They can be a part of this, this, this sector over here or over there. It don't matter if they're doctor, so-and-so. What matters is what truth, how do their truth match up with this truth right here? This means everything. The credentials behind people's names, 
apostle, pastor, so that don't mean nothing. The truth is right here. This is what set you and I both free. Amen. Everything else outside of this puts you in bondage. This sets you free. So uh, make sure that when people come at you claiming to be in the name of the Lord and claiming to be of truth, you try their truth with this truth. Amen. Uh, those of you that require and desire prayer. Folks, how many know that God, those of us that are saved and have accepted God's invitation to salvation through Jesus Christ, how many of you know that your prayers are not only to cover you and your family members, but those that cannot pray? I want to read something to you. I have the Bible. Before we get into Jonah, I wanted to make a pit stop into uh, the gospel according to John because I want to show you how important your prayers are. So real quick, go with me to the gospel according to John chapter 9 and um, let me set it up before we don't want to read all this let me just set up what's going on here the uh, the, the disciples Jesus and his disciples came ac came across the blind man that was born into the world blind the disciples asked Jesus Christ uh, who have sinned his disciples asked him said master who did sin this man or his parents or was he born blind and Jesus let him know that this man didn't sin, nor his parents, but that the works of God should be made manifest in him. Now, when we drop down uh, to verse uh, uh, 28 through 31, what you're going to see is that the Pharisees have a problem with the works that was performed through Jesus Christ upon the blind man. So much so that uh, they began to deny if the man was ever blind to begin with. Uh, and, and even to begin to deny their credentials that Jesus brought to the table, uh, trying to discount, well, we don't know enough about Jesus to know if this was a real miracle. And here's what the blind man says to the Pharisees, uh, the, gospel of, uh, of the Gospel of John chapter 9, uh, verse 30. The blind man answered, or the man answered and said unto them, <laughs> Why, herein is a marvelous thing. Uh, that you know not from whence he is, and yet he has opened mine eyes. He's talking about Jesus Christ. You don't know, you're focused on where he's come from, not knowing where he's come from, and while you're trying to figure out who he is and where he's came from, where he come from, you're missing the one thing, that he had opened my eyes, the miracles that God has performed through him. Now, this is what I need you to see. Look at the next verse here. Now, we know, that God heareth not sinners, but if any man be a worshiper of God, if any man serves God, he doeth and doeth his will, him he heareth. And so it goes back to what I was saying, uh, which brought us to this. Your prayers are not just to cover you and your loved ones and your family members, but God has us praying for those that cannot pray to him. Because they haven't chose to serve God. They haven't chose to worship him. They chose to worship the enemy. God is still compassionate towards them. He still loves them. But he can't receive this camaraderie between him and them. So he has us in our prayer lives covering those that cannot pray to him. This is why it's so important for us to have a prayer life because it not only allows us to be able to pull the supplies down from heaven that we need here on earth to supply the will of God, but it also we also petition uh, to the Most High God on behalf of those that cannot pray to God. This is what he has us here for, not only ourselves, but for others, right? Amen? So it's important that you build up your prayer life. This is the communication between you and God, and he's eager to hear from you. You may ask us to pray with you, and we are more, we are more than happy to oblige you in that, but God wants to hear from you too concerning not only you, but concerning them. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> we, my, wife and, my wife and I, we always joke, we always say, well, they said, and so who are they? So God wants us to pray for them being they, <laughs> if you will. Amen. So to God be the glory. Um, please, if, if uh, those of you that, that require and desire prayer, please go to our website. Uh, 
look for the prayer request tab, www.ubcchurch.org. Look for the prayer request tab. Once you click on that tab, it's going to bring up a web page. That web page allows you to fill out the confidential information uh, like your name, um, your email address, uh, the, the reason of your petition. And if you want your name to appear on our prayer list, uh, once you fill out that information, hit the submit button. My wife and I will receive it. We'll read through it to make sure those very things that you're asking us to stand with you in prayer over, make sure those things line up with the word of God. Um, if they don't line up with the word of God, then it's not to say that you, we won't pray for you because obviously if you're asking us to stand with you in prayer because you believe in that somebody's husband or somebody's wife is supposed to be married to you, uh, you know, we can't, we, it's, we can't agree with you as far as that petition goes. But it don't mean that we won't be praying for you. It just means that you probably, uh, you know, we, we, can't, we can't stand with you. We actually have to stand against what you're asking because that don't line up with the word of God. Amen. Uh, but you, you are important. Uh, your, your, your whole relationship with God, this world, does, as the world begins to persecute you, they don't know how much you stand for them. Uh, that they don't know how much you're praying for them that they would have what you have between you, God, and Jesus Christ. They don't know. Uh, and, and, and because they don't know, we, we, we ask God to, to look over them. We ask God to strengthen them, to open their eyes, if you will, uh, uh, that they can see the amount of love that he has for them. So much so that he did not only just give them Jesus Christ, but all of you that are saved, God gave the world you, the world uh, he gave you to, as a gift to them uh, uh, to represent him, that they know who to come to. He don't know how much, uh, they don't know how much he loves them. And we're going to learn some of this today, and I'm excited. Again, I've recorded this whole thing, and it didn't take. So uh, last but not least, those of you that are not saved, get saved. I mean, you already know that, that you know, your prayers don't, if you're not willing to worship and serve the Lord our God, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob, uh, if, if you're not willing to worship and, and serve the Lord our God, Jehovah Nisi and Jehovah Jireh, Yahweh, and, and, and if you're not willing to serve him, your prayers, he, they, they, he won't receive your prayers. And if he won't receive your prayers, what make you think he's going to receive your tithes? Don't get, I don't want your prayers, but you can give me your money. You know, it don't work like that. He wants you, this world is is breaking apart and dying. Nations are rising against nation, people against people. Uh, there is civil unrest happening all over the world. It's time for us to break away from that. God came to to um, God came to to uh, uh, Moses. Oh, I'm sorry. God came to Abraham. Rather, uh, his name was Abram at the time, and told him, I need you to get away from your family and I need you to go where I need to, to send you, you know, because I'm calling you in the service, if you will, so to speak. God is calling you out of these areas. He's calling you to break away from a whole lot of the stuff that you're into, uh, just so that you can have a chance to live and to, to let me tell you how much God loves us. He's created all things seen and unseen. Every plane that you see, every bird that flaps his wings from the tallest skyscraper to cars driving down the street, it is the gift of wisdom. It is God's wisdom that's on display that he has given to man and to beast. It is the wisdom that has come from God. So when you see planes flying, it's God's wisdom. Trees uh, uh, swaying back and forth. 
the moon, sh the moon shining in the night, the sun glistening in the day, the stars holding their places in the sky. That is all the wisdom of God put on display for us. Now, as vast as God has made the span of the universe, he loves us so much that he's going to come down when the time comes. He's going to come from heaven and establish his kingdom here on earth. Earth is going to be the center point of the king. It's going to be the place that the king of the whole celestials, seen and unseen, God is going to rest his kingdom here on this world. Why? Because he wants us to be together with him. That's how much he loves us. He wants you to spend eternal life with him. Now is the time to get it together. Not later. Later is too late. Now is the time. So uh, those of you that are not saved, please go to Romans 10 and 9, Romans 10 and 10, and drop down to Romans 10 and 13. You can wait till the end of this recording and uh, uh, fast forward to the end of the recording if you need to. Just get to the end. God will allow the doors of, the, uh, uh, of this kingdom to open up and offer and extend uh, the gift of salvation to you if you would receive it. You can also hit the salvation tab on our website and follow that, that information that's provided there wherewith you may be able to obtain eternal life. Amen. Anyway, let's get right into uh, uh, the final chapter of Jonah, uh, beginning uh, chapter 4. I've already prayed over this. I consider this to be the table that spread with the goodness of the Lord and with the bread that God has prepared, that being the bread of life, the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, I'm myself, I'm just a server. My job is to serve that which God has already been prepared, that have already prepared. The Holy Ghost had invited you and myself to this holy gathering. This is a holy gathering. And, and the table has been set. God has prepared the bread, which is the Lord Jesus Christ. And he has called both you and I through his Holy Spirit to come and break bread together. Amen. Uh, you accepted the invitation. This is why you're listening to this recording. I accepted the invitation as well. This is why the recording was recorded, if you will. The Holy Ghost has blessed us. He's called us to be. Amen. Uh, so without any further ado, let's come together and eat. Amen. Now, again, we're, we're coming at you with the final chapter, Jonah chapter 4, beginning at verse 1. Watch what this says here. But it displeased Jonah exceedingly, uh, and he was very angry. And he prayed unto the Lord and said, I pray thee, O Lord, was not this my saying when I was yet in my own country, when I was in my country? Therefore I fled before unto Tarshish, for I knew that thou art a gracious God, and merciful, and slow to anger, and of great kindness, and repentest thee of the evil. Now what's Jonah's problem? What is his problem? Uh, a lot of times we want... Um, a lot of times we feel that people don't deserve the kind of mercy that God is willing to extend them. Uh, I'll even go as far as to say that if, if it was up to us, we'd send a whole lot of people to hell uh, that, we feel that, <laughs> that we feel are well deserving of such a, a place. Uh, but God is not the same way. And Jonah, we've already read about Nineveh and the various acts of Nineveh. And, and just to put things back into perspective, hold your places there. Let's, let's go and read a little bit. Uh, let's just revisit some of the acts of Nineveh. Go with me real quick to uh, Nahum uh, chapter 3 is where we want to be. Nahum chapter 3. Let's revisit some of the acts of Nineveh. Look at what this says there. Nahum chapter 3. Uh, you're looking at, what, just a couple books away here? Woe to the bloody city. This is talking about Nineveh. It is all full of lies and robbery, and the prey departeth not. That means it's, it's, it's con there's constant and continual victims there. Uh, they don't stop doing robbing and, and, and killing and murdering. They're, they they victims. It's full of victims, you know, from day in to day out. 
uh, the noise of the whip and the noise of the rattling of the wheels and of the prancing or the galloping horses and of the jumping or the charging chariots, if you will. So they're always on a mission uh, to, to go pillage someplace or someone, uh, to go cause desolation and devastation. They're always on a mission of destruction. It says the horsemen's lifted up, the horsemen lifted up both the bright sword and the glittering spear. And there is a multitude of slain and a great number of carcasses. There's carnage all over within and outside of the city. Um, uh, and there is, there is none end of their corpses. They stumble upon their corpses. You can't take a few feet without falling over some of the dead that's laying around in the street. Uh, so if they have this kind of respect to their own city, imagine the, the, the deeds that they do outside of their other cities when they go and invade these nations. And these nations are intimidated because Nineveh's reputation precedes them. The nations know that within the city of Nineveh itself, uh, uh, there's, you know, carnage and carcasses laying dead in the street. Now, if they don't care for their own, uh, how do these other nations think that they, they're going to fare when coming up against uh, uh, the Assyrians, you know, which is who, 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 you know, who dwell in Nineveh, right? So it's just kind of shedding light on why Jonah feel that the olive branch shouldn't be extended over to, to, the, to, to the Assyrians who dwell in Nineveh. Uh, Jonah feel like the things that they've, that they've done, uh, they should be hell bound. But Jonah is also saying, I knew that from the time you sent me into Nineveh, I knew right then and there that you wasn't going to take them out. Because otherwise, you wouldn't have never sent me. You don't need to send me if you're going to pour wrath on them, God. You could just pour wrath right then and there, and they wiped off the planet. But the fact that you sent me was evident enough to myself that you were going to spare them. I had a problem with it. This is what Jonah is saying, right? So Jonah is saying, from the time that you gave me the assignment and you, that you were going to send me over there, this is why I didn't want to go in the first place. Because I already knew that you was about to say them folk. I know well enough to know that when your word comes out from me, that it's not coming back to you void. And you, you, you kind of think about it, Jonah being the messenger. This is why it's so important for us to go and to speak to those that God would have us to speak to. God will drop a word or a message within us, and then he'll send us somewhere as carriers. And so when we get to where we're supposed to go as far as the delivered address, uh, whoever God gives it to, whenever they decide to open up the message that God is going to allow them to have, and I'm speaking metaphorically, of course, uh, whoever God is trying to minister to, that word is going to come out and accomplish. That word is either going to testify against them or be a testimony on behalf of, of somebody. But God uses us to pave the way for, for grace or to pave the way for destruction. He uses us. And no, uh, uh, Jonah already said, the fact that you were sending me over there, I knew your word was going to prevail. I knew that if they would receive it, their lives would be changed and they would be spared. That's why I try not to jump on this mission when you told me. This is why I tried to take off, because I didn't want to be part of their salvation. They got too much blood on their hands to live, right? So this is what Jonah is saying, you know. And he just, he just... Being real, I guess he's just keeping it real between God, you know him and God. But God is what make you think. And 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 what's beautiful about this is God is showing that I'm not just your God, Jonah. But I don't you. I don't just love you. I love them too, regardless of how much blood they got on their hands. I love them too, and I don't just want to be your God. I want to be their God too. The same uh, as those sailors on the ship. They didn't know me. And when I had to make a special guest appearance in my, in my raft trying to chase after you, they got a chance to know that I'm the only wise true God. 
Now they worship me. Now they know me. Now they serve me because I love them. And this is what God is trying to convey, or this is what he is going to convey to Jonah. Um, but again, you know, what you're seeing is Jonah's relationship. And Jonah knew enough to know how gracious God is and, and uh, how merciful and how slow to anger he is. Uh, and Jonah knew. Jonah was like, I knew it. I knew before I took off to start this, this, this mission that you, you were going to give them a chance, that they was going to see the same love and kindness that drew me, the same love and kindness that pulled me out of the well is the same love and kindness that they were going to contend with, and who can resist that, right? So verse 3, Therefore now, O Lord, take, I beseech thee, my life from me, for it's better for me to die than to live. So Jonah having a temper tantrum. It's like, I just knew you were going to spare him, so i tell you what, you know, i tell you what, they're going to and kill me, because I don't even want to see this thing play out. I don't want to see them falling in love with the same, the same one that I love. I don't want them, you the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. You know, why should they be able to call on you? You know what, this, this, this kill me, I don't even want to see this thing play out. This is, this is, <laughs> now, here's what I, you know, a lot of time people look at what Jonah was saying. I look at the relationship that Jonah has seen, because one thing about God, God wants us to keep it real. He wants us to be sincere about how we feel. This is the only way you grow. If you, you know, we let our words be seasoned with grace, if you will. Uh, when we talk to one another, God wants us to keep it real. When we talk to him, you know, he don't want us quoting the scripture every time we talk to him. He, he want to hear what you got to say, not what he had to say. So he wants us, when we begin to speak to him, he wants us to tell him what's going on with us. This is the only way we can be healed or to, or to receive some kind of understanding, right? So this is pretty interesting because you're seeing the kind of relationship that, you know, that Jonah has with his father, you know, God in heaven. You know? So going down to verse 4 here, then said the Lord, doest thou will to be angry, son? He's talking to Jonas. Doest thou will to be angry? It, 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 what you mad about, Jonah? <laughs> doest thou will to be angry? What you got an attitude for, man? So here's what, here's what Jonah has to say here. So Jonah went out of the city, and he sat down on the east side of the city, and there he made himself a booth, or he made himself um, somewhat of a place to, to be, so a shelter, if you will, for shade. Uh, he made himself a booth or a shelter and sat under it in the, sh you know, in the, in the shadow or in the shade uh, till he might see what would become of the city, right? Well, if you ain't going to kill me, at least let me get on out of the city. I already know you're going to save it. But just in case you ain't, let me get out of harm's way and just look from afar. Now, remember, Jonah went into the city about a day's travel. So depending on what side he got out of the city, he either went another two days. The city was three days in length. Or he went back the way he came and got out of the city and sat on the edge of it. So... He festering with an attitude. It's hot, so he's looking for some shade. And when you're already mad about something, when it's hot outside, you get irritated, aggravated, agitated. You know that 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 adds to, and if not, it enhances your attitude. If you're already mad, the heat. You know, I ain't dealing with no air conditioning. I ain't dealing with no fans in the windows like we have today, or or any extent like that. So when you're already mad. The heat just kinds of, it just kind of add to it, if you will, right? So verse 6, so the Lord prepared a gourd, some kind of plant. We don't know what kind of plant this is, but he prepared this, this plant, and he made it to come up over Jonah that it might be a shadow or shade over his head to deliver him from his grief. So Jonah was exceedingly glad uh, of the gourd or of the plant that God made. God made a plant specifically to, um, to give Jonah the shade, right? And it was nice shade. Jonah really appreciated it. And it began to calm him down. Once he started cooling off, he began to settle down, right? Now, this is father-son relationship here is what you see going on here. 
Uh, so as Jonah began to calm down, here's verse 7. But God prepared a worm when the morning rose the next day, and it smote the plant or smote the gourd that it withered. And it came to pass that when the sun did rise, that God prepared a vehement, a vehement east wind, and the sun beat the head or beat upon the head of Jonah that he fainted or he gotten, he felt faint, if you will. Or, or he, he didn't necessarily pass out because, as you see, after the comma, he wished in himself to die and said, it's better for me to die than to, than to live. So he started feeling faint. Um, and, and he started having a temper again. He started having an attitude problem again. And God took away the, the, the plant. God, you know, God made the plant. And then in the middle of the night, God made this worm. God sent this worm. And this worm uh, spent the night tearing down the Jonah's shade, right? Tearing down this live plant, if you will. And so when Jonah, when Jonah looks and sees, uh, in the, the next day, he sees that the his plant withered and the sun God sent this violent wind if you will or this kind of wind that brought this extreme heat and so when it began to hit Jonah he's looking at the shade and he's seeing that the plant that was giving him some relief has withered away right so now he's like oh just just kill me just kill me and here's why I call it a father-son relationship because our kids, when they don't get what they want and they temper time, especially if it's something that they seriously want and they feel like they just got to have it and if they don't get it, they can just die. Our kids have a temper tantrum and they just go all off. But God in his wisdom, he is trying to show Jonah something. He's not quick to grab a belt and tear him up. But what he wants to do is he wants to show him uh, what, what's going on, how how his love and his affection is misguided, or how his anger and his animosity, if you will, is misguided. This is a real father-son relationship, and this is really what I, I like to focus on here. Watch what God says to hear, God says to Jonah as he's, and he's ministering to Jonah with the worm, with this plant. All of this is ministry, as he's ministering to Jonah, right? So here's verse 9. God said to Jonah, doest thou well to be angry for the gorge? And Jonah said, I do well to be angry, even unto the death. Now what? I do, yeah, 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 you right. You asked me a question, do it well for me to be angry over the plant? Yeah, I'm mad over the plant. What you go do? You going to kill me? Go ahead. I'm ready to go anyway. Go ahead. It's, 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 it, even though Jonah sounds foolish, it's still a beautiful display of the relationship that God has, because he's not looking for zombies to serve him and to love him. He's not looking for zombies. He created us in his image and his likeness and even conformed us to the image of the Lord Jesus Christ, whereby we can have a relationship with him. And what you're seeing are the results of the relationship. And, and here's something else that I want you to see, too. Jonah being a man of God. This is a man of God. Obviously, Jonah... Ain't what our idea of a man of God, somebody that loves everybody, that's always there ministering to each and every person that God would send us to and giving them the best of what, what the kingdom of God would have the offer according to what God has placed in our hands to give, right? Um, you can see, we think somebody being extremely holy and faithful and fervent. Jonah seemingly to be the opposite of that. And what is that saying? That God has no respect of persons. That God chooses people that the world wouldn't choose. And God chooses these people to represent him and to get his glory off of the things that he sends them to do. We look for the best of the best of the best, sir, to go and to handle uh, some of the uh, uh, kingdom of God things. But God is not like that. Uh, God ch chooses ordinary people to do extraordinary things for him. He can't send somebody with too much of an ego because they're going to be looking to glorify themselves. You know, So th that's one thing that I wanted you to see about Jonah is look at how he struggles uh, with, with, with temper tantrums. And, and he wants God to be just the God of the Hebrews. 
you know, especially not the I don't want the Assyrians talking about you how you done how you done saved them. Ah, you my God. Why you gotta be their God too? And you gonna be everybody's God. They killed me, so I ain't gotta see all that, you know. But it's, it's beautiful. There's a relationship here. So God is asking Jonah, you are you angry over the plant? Do it you well to be angry. Is it right for you to have an attitude because I took away the plant? Are, are you serious, son? Is this what your issue is because I took the plant away? You really got an attitude over this? Jonah was like, yeah, yeah, that's right. I got an attitude over that. Do it well for me to be angry because of what you did to the plant. Now I tell you what killed me. You ain't got to deal with it now. You got to deal with my attitude if you didn't lay me down to sleep. <laughs> right? Well, let's, let's read on because this is really... This beautiful story. Then said the Lord, then said the Lord in verse 10, thou hast had pity on the, on the plant or on the gourd, uh, for the which thou hast not labored, neither madest it grow, which came up in the night and perished in the night. God was like, son, you, you, you seem to have a whole lot of feelings for this plant that you haven't neither planted you haven't watered. You haven't tended to it. You ain't did nothing but enjoy the proceeds of the shade that came from the plant. But you, should, for, but for something that you haven't invested nothing into, you sure do have a lot of feelings for it. But look at what else what God says here in verse 11. He says, And should not I spare Nineveh, that great city, wherein are much more than six score thousand persons. And if you do the math on six score, you figure a score is 20. So you're talking six score. Six times 20 uh, is 120, right? So he said 120,000 is what God is saying here. He says, should I not have spared, should I not have had mercy on Nineveh, that great city, wherein there are more than 120,000 persons that cannot discern between their right hand and their left hand, and also much cattle. So God is saying to Jonah, you got your nerves, son. Uh, you didn't invest anything into the plant. And you got a nerve to have an attitude because the plant died? What about those people? No, what about those people, Jonah? What about the Assyrians in Nineveh? He said, them people didn't know their left hand from the right hand. It would be different if they knew me and they cursed me. It would be different if they knew me and they did these things against me, but they didn't know better. He said, and so you want me to have mercy on the plant, but you don't want me to have mercy on the people. God was telling Jonah, he said, you got, you got mercy on a plant that you didn't even create. God is saying, but I created not only the plant, but I created the people. And if you got mercy over something that you ain't created, should I not have mercy over something that I have created, which are the people? He said, you got 120,000 people that you want me to wipe out the map that these people didn't even know left from right. And when, they, when, they, when you delivered the word and they received the word, because they knew better, they did better. Should I not do better? Should I not spare them? after they've changed their ways? So Jonah, I'm not the one with the problem, is what God is saying. Son, I'm not the one with the problem here. I think you're the one with the problem. You've got more compassion on the plant than you do the people, whereas you didn't invest in nothing into the plant. So this, this is, again, this is God ministering uh, to Jonah. God is saying, what about, the, what about the livestock? What about the cattle that's there? I told take them out too. But as long as the plant survived, you just fine. Plant can't praise. Uh, plant, plant, you, you, you ain't got to worry about me being a god over the plant, but you don't want me to be the god over the people or over the Assyrians. So this is a beautiful story that, um, beautiful story because the story shows the relationship uh, 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 that, that father and son, Jonah, and, and, and the almighty God shows the relationship there. It shows how possessive and how jealous. Uh, you, you can see a God is a jealous God, so his children are jealous. They don't want nobody else to have, they don't want to share God with nobody else, right? Um, but it also sh shows that God is the God 
uh, over the Gentiles, that he will extend the olive branch, that he extends salvation. This is salvation. Make no mistake about it. When God chose to spare Nineveh and not bring judgment on Nineveh based off the, the, their deeds, their, their sinful deeds, uh, they, they accepted salvation. He, they, they chose life rather than death. We're talking Gentiles. Uh, people that didn't know God, the, the, the Jews, those that are non-Jews that didn't know God, those that were part of the world, God cared enough about them to bring them his truth, and they received it and were saved. They didn't die. They didn't perish from the wrath of God. Hmm? And then God begins to minister to, to, to show us that to, for us, uh, God loves all people. Sometimes we put more love and more emphasis and more compassion on things other than people and cherish those things more than we do people. So this is that will conclude um, our story uh, for Jonah. And, and, and a lot of times, you know, we look at uh, countries, uh, different faiths and different religions out and there's only I'm one of these ones that I, I'm a Bible believer and there's only one way to the Father and that's through the Son Jesus Christ the only begotten child of God no other way to the Father I'm one of these ones to believe that that if people hang in there just hang in there they're gonna keep doing what they want to do you know hang in there hang in there I'm one of these ones to believe that God loves us so much that, that people at, at some point in time are going to receive the truth and they're going to receive the fact that Jesus Christ is the only begotten of the Father and the only way to the Father. Amen? Now, those of you that are not saved, this is pretty significant. Jonah is a great study for us because these were people that, that they first of all, for them to change mean they believed God. They believed God. We're talking of the Assyrians that dwelt in Nineveh. They believed that when, when the man of God went there and told them, you will perish within 40 days, uh, uh, God is going to, he's going to decimate this place because of your sinful ways. They believed the man of God when he told them that they can't keep continuing on in that sinful manner. And they decided to lay aside those things. If this was their sins, if this was their sins, they decide to get rid of it and hope they humble themselves. Because you got to humble yourself. When somebody tells you about yourself, you can't be, I'll rebuke that. That ain't who I am and that ain't how I am. You don't know me. Get away. No. <laughs> no. When, when somebody actually truly uh, speak to you concerning uh, character flaws about yourself, in order for you to receive and to be able to discern if there's any truth, you got to humble yourself first. You got to come down. You have to humble yourself first so that you can hear what's being said. Uh, uh, and so that you can detect and discern if there's any truth about what's being said about you. And so they humbled themselves. Uh, those of Nineveh, they humbled themselves and they received the truth that the, that the, the all-wise true God that he, the, 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 the judge and jury of all things, the creator of all things, that he himself was displeased with them and that he was going to make them pay for what they, what they had done. And they humbled themselves. They believed that there was an all true God and they believed that they were in the line of his fire. <laughs> and, and they decided to put away their, from from the highest of them, which was the king and his administration, to the lowest of them. They all laid aside their sins, cut their sins off, and they began to change their ways. And because they began to change their ways, God changed his mind about what he was going to do to them. Right? So they believed the destruction and the wrath that was to come on them. And because they believed, they began to fear God and they began to change and, uh, and lay aside those things that whereby they were so easily uh, caught up in, right? Now, what does that have to do with us concerning salvation? Go with me to Hebrews, uh, Hebrews chapter 12. Uh, beginning at verse 1, Hebrews 12 and 1. I want to show you something here. 
Hebrews 12 and 1. A lot of people don't, they don't receive um, salvation um, because they, they say it's too hard. And they, they just, they settle for what they know best. I was visiting a cousin of mine uh, recently and I asked him about the city that he lives in. I said, man, you know, you, you're going to be here forever, if you will. You're gonna, you, you ain't going to never move out of here. And what he said to me is, is uh, it's not that I like it. It's just that I know it. I'm comfortable. I know it. That's what he said to me. I want, you, I want to show you something here in the scriptures. This is Hebrew ch tw uh, chapter 12, beginning at verse 1. Wherefore, seeing we also are surrounded with uh, that word comp compassed, it's, it means surrounded. So, seeing that we are also surrounded about with such great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which do it so easily beset us. Excuse me. Let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Now, here's what the scripture is saying here. We have no excuse. Uh, God, unlike any other generation before us, the, we have the word at, at, the, at the fingertip. We carry personal computers with us. Uh, we can have these Bible studies with us as we're traveling on tr subway trains or bus lines or airplanes. We got videos where we can fellowship and learn of God. We have, we have Jesus Christ sitting on God's right hand side interceding for us, reminding God, you know, uh, how hard it is in the flesh and how he has overcome and he's constantly getting God to, to, to grant us with grace and mercy. So not only did Jesus forgive, not only by, by the shedding of blood were we cleansed of every sin, past, present, and, and future for those that are coming into the fold, but he's also given Jesus Christ as a reminder to God, a sweet-smelling sacrifice, Savior, if you will, sweet-smelling Savior, sitting next to God, a sweet aroma, constantly reminding God of the blood that he shed on our behalf, right? He also gave us his Holy Spirit, huh? gave us his Holy Spirit to keep us sealed, to lead and to guide us, He's given angels to protect us and has given us understanding of his holy word. So that's a great cloud of witnesses. We have the testimony from the, from, from the saints in the past and in the present. We also know what's going to happen in the future. We got this, whereas we got the word of God from past, present, and future that others don't have. This is a, considered a cloud of witnesses, if you will. The Word of God, the Holy Spirit, every tool and resource that we need, Jesus Christ in heaven. So we don't have to settle for the sin and say, this is the best I can do and this is all I want to do. I'm just going to settle with this and just be condemned. No. You got to ask yourself, is this sin worth the judgment that's going to come? See, Nineveh believed when the man of God came in Nineveh and told Nineveh uh, that that Judgment is coming within 40 days. This place, of, the way that you decimated and desolated and the carnage and the carcasses that you laid in the street, by the time the Lord come and do what he's going to do, it's going to be far worse than anything you've ever seen. Them people got scared and they knew and they, they believed what the man of God said on behalf of God and they changed their ways. Whatever was so hard for them, they set those things to the side and said that these acts, these things that we're doing, it ain't worth my death <laughs> it ain't worth me going through the wrath of God so I'm laying those things aside and I'm moving on without them you understand what I'm saying this is what the scripture says wherefore seeing that we have every tool and every available resources at our disposal so that we can achieve the very task that we are assigned so that we can obtain salvation because we have all that let us lay aside every weight and every sin which so easily beset us so we have to repent of the sins right I mean 
Guys, those of you that have your girlfriends and you've been living with them 10, 12, 20 years and you ain't married them, it's time to marry them without no excuses. Marry them or cut it off because the relationship is not worth going to hell over. Trust me, you, you, you may be living, you may thinking you're living and having a good time right now, but when your number is called and you have not made the change, you set yourself up. To be, uh, to be a participant and an occupant of the lake of fire. And it's a real thing. The thing about it is you got to be willing to, to lay the sand aside. You got to be willing to come to God and say, I am ready. And watch this. It's going to be hard. It's going to be hard. When we first come, we come and we're excited and, and we give our lives and we're in this honeymoon stage. But after the honeymoon stays, the reality of the things begin to kick in. Those very things that we've been abstaining from, the things we've turned away from, they begin to call out to us. The enemy begins to throw it all in the face. If, if, if our poison is alcohol, the, the enemy put it all in our face. We can't even have communion. They want to use real wine, right? <laughs> but my point is, at the end of the day, you, the enemy is going to come at you with the sin, but while God has got you in a honeymoon stage and given you strength, you got to start making the decisions to cut those things off. That's what Nineveh did. They didn't just say, okay, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, I'm going to do it, and then not do it. The king, all his administration, they all went and they did it. They, 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 said, they even said, don't eat. Less, they humbled themselves to where they understood that this thing was true. They had to humble themselves. Once they, hum, once they humbled themselves, they was able to receive the truth. They knew that God and his judgment was real against them. And they chose to do something about it. Rather than perish, rather than say the life is too hard, rather than being high and mighty and be like, well, let them try it. They humbled themselves and did what was necessary so that they could receive salvation. We have to do the same. We have to be willing to let go of this stuff. Humble ourselves. Let go of those things that have been weighing us down, that's been causing us to sin, and move away from it. I heard a pastor say that when somebody said they struggle, you know, they say, well, I'm how you doing? Man, I've been, I've been struggling with my faith. Well, it's not that we're excited. It's not that we're, we're, we're sad or, or we're happy that you failed and you got back up. But the joy comes in that the fact that you are struggling. What does that mean? Before you, before you got saved, there was no struggle. You just gave in to all your sins. So it's natural for you to fight because you're fighting to stay sin free, right? You're fighting to stay cleansed. Right. And so when you fall from time to time, not that it's OK for you to fall, but there is grace given to you. That's what Jesus is for. There is grace given to you when you do fall, when you get back up and you you're hurting and you're sad because you fell and you're struggling. That's a great thing that you're struggling because it means that you are trying to resist. You are trying to put that thing away. See, a lot of us, we get saved, but we go back to the same old life that God delivered us from, right? So let me finish reading here, Tw uh, Hebrews 12 and 2. Looking unto Jesus as an example, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, the best example. He is the perfecter, the originator and the perfecter of our faith. So looking unto Jesus, uh, who is the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him, he endured the cross, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. Jesus knew what he was going to come into. And so when he looked at what he was going to come into versus what he was going to have to go through, he knew that what I was coming into was way, it, it was worth way more than what I was going to go through. And this, the end of the end prize was worth more than the race itself. He knew that all I needed to do was just get through the race, get to the end, and I'm set up. It's, it's, it's all good. You have to determine that if that which you are not willing to let go of, it's worth it. 
is worth what God has set before you right now. You have to make the decision. You have to make the decision that is your boyfriend or your girlfriend uh, a fornication with them, living with them, uh, sex, drugs, alcohol, murder, uh, uh, whatever sins that you're committing that you are not willing to let go of. You have to determine within yourself, is it worth it? Is it worth the lake of fire? Because if Jesus had to go through something to get to where he is now, you're going to have to go through something too. So what you have to determine from the outset, from the onset, if you will, is that what God is showing you, what we are preaching to you about the reward that you are able to claim, is it worth, that, is it worth more than what you are holding, into, holding on to right now and refusing to let go? You have to determine that. Can't nobody make that determination for you. And then if you determine that what the, the, the way that you're living, it ain't worth it, that you rather have eternal life because you believe God, you know that what, what, what's being said is true, then now you have to repent. You have to do what Nineveh did, what, what the Assyrians did in Nineveh. You have to do what God did. God, because of the, the changes that they made, God made changes. He said, okay, because of your change, I'm not going to do what I said that I was going to do. I'm going to change my mind and change my action. I'm going to lay low and not going to do it because of the changes that they made. Now, you've got to be willing to make some changes. Hmm? Got to be willing to make some changes. Now, let me show you something about struggle. Go with me to 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Just go ahead a few here. 1 Peter chapter 4. Beginning at verse 1. For as much then as Christ uh, had suffered for us in the flesh, arm yourselves likewise with the same mind. For he had suffered in the flesh, he that has suffered in the flesh has ceased from sin. So if you're struggling, uh, the reason why you're struggling is because you're not giving your sin, you're not giving your flesh the things you used to give it anymore. And it's having a temper tantrum like Jonah. It wants things to be like it used to be. It wants to go places that it used to go. It wants to indulge in the things that it used to indulge in. Uh, it's going to be hard because it's going to have a temper. And it's going to be like Jonah. I, I just, just let me die. If I can't have what I want, then it, I'm, it's not, nothing is worth living anymore. Your flesh is going to be like that. But I'm telling you that God has set salvation before you and he has set uh, a, a love for you and a reward at the end of this whole race. But what has to happen is you got to go through it and you got to get through it. And you got to get through it with those sins that has been keeping you away from God, keeping you from being able to pray and receive things from heaven. You got to lay those things, you got to let them go. If Christ had to go through it, we got to go through it too. But it's going to get easier. It's going to get easier. There is nothing like the peace that you got at nighttime, not worried about uh, uh, things that you used to worry about. People, places, or things, and money, and job, and uh, uh, security. And, you know, there is a peace that God gives you. Uh, and it comes from Jesus Christ. Jesus said, my peace I give you, unlike the world give you, give I unto you. Jesus said, my peace is different. Their peace is temporary and it don't satisfy. Jesus is saying that his peace is not temporary and, and it does satisfy. There is things that God gives you right now to help you make it. All the resources, the cloud of witnesses that we have are resources to help us get through. That's what's there for us. You have to make the decision that you're going to lay aside those things right now. They're not worth it. Let me finish reading that verse 2, fourth, uh, 1 Peter chapter 4, verse 2. That no longer should, that he no longer should live the rest of his time in the flesh for the lust of man, but to the will of God. For the time past of our life may suffice us to have wrought the will of the Gentiles. 
when we walked in lasciviousness, lust, excessive wine, reveling, banqueting, and abominable idol idultery. Wherein they think it's strange that you run not with them to the same excess of riots speaking evil of you. To the same excess of riots speaking evil of you. So what is the scripture saying? It's saying in time past, it, it was good for us. It was good for our flesh that we indulged in those things like the Gentiles indulge in. Sex and, and the lust of the, of the flesh, uh, getting drunk and partying. And, and, and abominable things, worshiping other things. He says, uh, but now since we don't do that, the, your friends are going to chide. They're going to chide against you. They're going to come against you. They're going to think, how is it that you don't do these things and find enjoyment out of these things anymore? You know, why is it that you won't, I can't get you to come out with me anymore? Why I can't get you to share this, this marijuana or this cigarette or this alcohol with me anymore? We used to hang out. They look at you as you, you think you're better than them now. And it's not that you're better. It's just that you've determined what was more important to you. Salvation with God through Jesus Christ rather than condemnation of this world. The alcohol, all the things that this world has to offer is not worth what God has laid up. But in order for me to get to it, I have to be willing to repent. I have to be willing to let go of some stuff that I could come in to the eternal things. I got to be willing to let go of the temporary things that I could come into the eternal things. I, when it says set your eyes on Jesus, I got to set my things I got to set my eyes and my mind as on my example, Jesus Christ, which is in heaven. So I got to set my focus on heaven, not here on earth. Now, a couple more scriptures that we want to go to because we're talking about salvation. Uh, go with me to the gospel according to John 3.16, chapter 3, verse 16. Trying to hurry up and get through this here. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. So if you believe that God loved you so much, he loved you with the alcohol in your hand or without the alcohol, with the drug in your system or without the drug in your system. God loved you so much that he said the only way that they're going to make it is if I send my son to be a living sacrifice. I need to send him. I need to send my son to shed some blood because the blood that is shed from my son is going to be enough to cleanse them of all unrighteousness. So, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. This is what God is setting before you. This is life. He's saying what's before you that you've been indulging in is death. God wants to set life before you. He says, for God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world. He didn't send his son into the world to kill the world. The world is already condemned. They're already working towards death. Just like God sent Jonah to Nineveh so that they can receive life, God is sending me this word to give to you that you may receive life right now. You've already got death. Just like Nineveh, the carcasses was already laying in the street. They already had death. So this is what the scripture is saying. God didn't send Jesus in the world to condemn them. They already had death. Condemnation is death. They already had that. But he sent Jesus into the world that they may receive life. Let me finish the scripture. For God sent not his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Jesus Christ might be saved. That through Jesus we may have life. He that believeth on him is not condemned. But he that believeth not is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. So, if you deny the salvation that God is offering you, you can go back to doing things that you were already doing. You can go back to living the way you are already living. You can go back to sleeping around as you are already sleeping. You can go back to stilling as you had already been stilling. Sorry for the inconvenience. But those of you that do believe it on the name of the only begotten Son of God, the Lord Jesus Christ. Those of you that do believe that God sent Jesus to this world because he loved you so much that he wants better for you. 
then if you believe that, then this is for you, a better way of living. And, and, and a love for you that you'll be able to indulge in as partakers to be called the son of or daughter of God. He's got something better for you. But if you don't want it, then nothing's changed. You can pick up where you left off at, which is working on death, or death working on you, right? So you say, well, okay, I believe, I believe, so how, how do I get this, what you're offering? How do I get this? Well, go to Romans 10 and 9. If thou confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you believe that God loved you so much and he didn't want you to perish because without Jesus you are already perishing. You just don't know it yet. Maybe you know it and you just learn to live with the results of you perishing. Um, but God loves you so much. If you believe that God sent Jesus Christ and the only way to get to the Father is through the Son, and if you believe that Jesus is the only begotten of the Father that God has raised from the dead after his blood was shed, if you believe this, this is for you, this is salvation, then you are saved. Watch this. Go down to verse 10 and 13. It says, For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, let me caution you. You can't just call upon Jesus Christ to save you. You can't say, I believe that Jesus is the only begotten child of God. I believe that God did send Jesus down to this world and, and that at a, at a given time, uh, Jesus gave his life by allowing men to take him and kill him, put him up on a cross, put nails through his hands and to his feet to where blood was shed and they even took a spear and pierced him in his side whereas came out blood and water. I believe all this was done to Jesus and, and then I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead three days and three nights after he died that God brought him back to life. Not just in a spirit form but also in the physical form with the body and then eventually ascended Jesus up into heaven. I believe all this, but then you want to just go back and do what you want to do. It don't work like that. You can't confess Jesus to be a Lord and you don't listen to him, or you don't live for him. You can't choose Jesus and this life. You can't choose life and death. You have to choose one or the other. One more scripture that I want to share with you is 1 John 1 and 9. 1 John 1 and 9. 1 John 1 and 9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That means that, yeah, there is forgiveness for you, but you can't keep going back and doing the same old thing time and time again. I want to keep doing this because I don't want to change. You, God will forgive you of your sins, but you can't go back. You can't say, I believe but you don't believe him for the wrath to come if you don't change your life. You've got to be willing to change. And I, I'm here to tell you, it's, it's going to be a little difficult, but it's worth it. It's worth more than anything you've been trying to hold on to on this earth. Because the things that you've been holding on to on this earth is crumbling around you. It's... it's just like the earth is dying, those things that you're holding on to is dying too, and you along with it. Now, if you're ready, this prayer is for you. All you got to do is repeat it with me. You say, Eternal God, I come before you right now, and I come before you, God, in the name of Jesus Christ. Father, I confess my sins before you. I've seen my wrong. I know my wrong, and I'm tired of of my wrong. I don't want to go back to living the way that I used to. I want to do things different. I want to live for you and not the devil. I want to worship you and serve you and no longer myself. God in heaven, I ask you of your forgiveness for my sins and I repent of my sins, God. I believe that you loved us so much so, God, that you gave us Jesus Christ, your only begotten son, a pathway to salvation. 
I believe that you sent Jesus Christ down to this earth. And at an appointed time in his life that he allowed man to place him up on a cross that, that he was crucified. And I believe that he allowed his blood to be shed and he gave his life in the act of murder, that men murdered him. But three days and three nights after his death, I believe that you resurrected Jesus from the dead. And some 40 days after his resurrection, you ascended him up into heaven. After you brought him back to life, God, you ascended him up into heaven, and now Jesus is on your right-hand side. I believe, God, this I believe. Now, the scripture says we got to call upon the name of the Jesus. We got to call upon the name of Jesus that we may be saved. You say, Jesus, I call you. Jesus Christ of Nazareth, I call you right now to come in me and to live in me and to live through me. I receive salvation that God has offered through you, Jesus. I receive the gift of salvation by faith. And I'm asking if you would just come into my heart and come into my life. Set up a throne in my heart. Lead me and guide me from this day forward. I understand that it's going to get tough. And I understand that there's going to be some struggles, but Lord, I'm willing to go forward and not go back. I'm willing to serve you and to be obedient. This day, I make you my Lord and I make you my Savior. Right now, Jesus, save me right now from the dead of sins, God. Cleanse me of all unrighteousness with your holy blood. Thank you for being my Redeemer. And thank you for saving me, Jesus. If you said it and you meant it, and I know somebody got saved because I, I was feeling that. Uh, and I bless God for you. If you said it and you meant it, somebody is going to get saved. Come and I believe that to be the case. I was feeling that. Somebody will be saved. You are saved. If you said it, with the, it says with the, with the mouth, confession is made unto salvation. With the heart, we believe. With the mouth, we confess. We just have to be willing. Just as Nineveh, they laid aside their sins. They humbled themselves. They accepted what was wrong about themselves. They laid it aside, and, and, and they was willing to change their life. So God was willing to work with them to keep them. And they believed the man of God when he said that God was going to rain down judgment. You have to believe about those things that we are to come into and those things that the world would come into if they choose not to worship the Lord our God. So last thing that we have to do is get you baptized. So what do we do? Uh, you're already saved. So make no mistake about it. You're already saved. Now, we want to get you baptized. Baptism represents our burying within Jesus Christ and our resurrection in Jesus Christ. It's ceremonial. It's, it's an outward expression of what's been the transformation that's taken place in us. This is a, an outward expression of compliance, if you will. So what's going to happen is you're going to get with the man of God. And you're going to let a man of God know in a place of worship. And I don't call these places of worship the church because you are now the church. You are the church. You are an extension of the kingdom of God. Christ died for you and not the building that you worship in. He died for you. You are now the church. So now what's going to happen is you get with a man of God and he is going to totally, you tell the man that I want to be buried, I want to be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And that man of God is going to take you and totally submerge you into the water. And then he's going to immediately bring you up out of the water. So he has submerged you in the water which represents our burying in Christ. And then we come up immediately out of the water which represents our resurrection in Christ Jesus. Uh, again, uh, this represents uh, 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 an outward outward expression of compliance based on what the transformation that's taken place inside of us. It's also a clear conscience 
uh, between us and God. Amen. Folks, I had a good time. Again, this is the second recording, but God, you're worth it. And his children, you're worth the time uh, that, that, you know, God calls us to spend with these recordings. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your Bible studies today. I'd like to also give a shout out to my wife. This is our anniversary today, our 11th anniversary, our wedding anniversary. Amen. And I just, I bless God for her, you know, and, and uh, she's not only my wife, but she is my friend. Uh, she is a part of me. And I'm blessed enough that God would allow me to spend this part of my life with this woman as my wife in my life and, and to uh, cultivate uh, the goodness of heaven, to have that within her that I could even draw from it. I know what it's like to be alone, but I know what it's like to have someone. And, and I've been alone, and now I, I have my wife, and, and um, careful not to put her before the Lord our God, but he gives me an opportunity to, her, to enjoy her company, and I, I thank him for it. And, uh, so again, happy anniversary to you, sweetheart. I love you. Anyway, people... Uh, God bless you. Again, thank you for allowing us to be a part of your Bible study until we meet again. God bless you and we love you. Amen and amen. This has been a United Body of Christ Church video production. You can visit our website at www.ubcchurch.org.